Centripetal acceleration can kind of be a tough one because things are not as they appear. The way you think things are are often not the way things actually are. So this picture here I took after I drove home from work in the winter time and I noticed these ice crystals growing on the hub of my tire. And so let me ask you, as these ice crystals rotate around, what is the direction of the force on each individual ice crystal. Is the force inward? Is it outward? Or is it off tangent? And the answer is inward. You might not believe me. You might think, well, they're growing outward, so the force must have been outward. But remember, things are not as they appear. So let's look at it this way. Here is an ice crystal, and they grow because a little water droplet is being pulled down like this and the ice crystal stayed stationary. But what if the, we reverse things around and say that the water droplet stayed stationary and there was a force on the ice crystal in the up direction? The ice crystal would have accelerated away from the water droplet and the ice crystal would have grown for the same reason it did here. But what happens if that ice crystal is attached to something that's spinning around? That little water droplet at that moment is heading off tangent in that direction. And the inertia of that water droplet wants to keep it going in the same speed at a, in the same direction. So as that water droplet continued going off to the right here, the ice crystal accelerated that way or there was a force on it that way. And the ice crystal grew. So we need to give names to the di certain directions. An arrow pointing off that way we call left. Well, maybe you knew that one. Or this one right, up, and down. All right, I think we're good. But what happens if something is spinning around? It was going up for a while, then left, and down, and right. Um, so just saying those directions don't really describe what's going on with that ice crystal. Now I did say earlier that the force on that ice crystal was in, and we've got to give a name for the direction in. And it was Newton that came up with these names, and the name is centripetal. Now it looks like a funny word here, but we can break it down. Centripetal means center seeking. The word uh, petere means to seek or to strive after. So centripetal just means center seeking. And a force away from the center is called centrifugal or center fleeing. Think of a fugitive. Fugitives flee. So a centra fugitive would be a force or just naming the direction away from the center of a circle. All right, so if this is a ball whirling around a circle like this, is there a centripetal force on the ball or a centrifugal force on the ball? Meaning, is the ball being pulled in or is the ball being pulled out? Well, let's do this again before I answer that question. And when the ball gets to this point again, we're going to take some scissors and we're going to cut the string and see what happens to the ball. Ready for it? Snip. The ball at that moment was traveling in that direction, so it just continues traveling in that direction. Okay, well, how does that answer this question? Well, let's say the string did not get cut. Let's say the string was still there and the ball was still tied to the string. This is where the ball would have been if the string got cut. But because the string did not get cut, the ball was pulled from where it would have been to where it currently is. The ball got pulled in to a circle. So we say there is a centripetal force on the ball. The ball was not being pulled outward as it whirled around. The ball was being pulled inward centripetally. Okay, and Newton's third law, action, reaction, we can say the action is the string pulled the ball in 
and the reaction would be the ball pulls the string out. There is a centrifugal force acting, but the, the outward force, the centrifugal force, does not act on the ball. It is acting on the string as a reaction to the string pulling the ball in. Hammer throw here, you can see from the person's hands the direction that they are applying the force. It looks as if the ball is being pulled outward. It is not. As it being, is being whirled around here, the hands are pulling the ball in. And we can again think of Newton's third law. There is a centripetal force acting on the ball. The ball is being pulled in. As a reaction to that, there is a centrifugal force on the hands. You could say hands pull ball in as an action. The reaction would be ball pull hands out. There is an outward force, but it does not act on the ball. It is acting on the thing that is acting on the ball. Action, reaction. And, and remember that circular motion is difficult because things are not as they appear. As you ride on this ride, you feel like you are being pushed outward, away from the center. But that's not the case. As this thing whirls around, your motion is off tangent to that. The back is pushing you into a circle, and as a reaction, you are pushing the back outward. You're not being pushed outward. The back here is being pushed outward. The back is pushing you inward. So if we change our frame of reference, it tends to help us understand what's going on. At this moment, you are traveling that way. The ball, the car veers off to the right. And if you were not wearing your seatbelt or the door was open, you might fly out of the car. But if you are wearing your seatbelt and the door is closed, all that stuff would push you in to the circle. So we can say the driver experienced a centripetal force from the door, perhaps. As a reaction to that, you are pushing on the door outward. There's a centrifugal force on the door. So if the car goes faster and faster and faster, we call that positive acceleration because the force is going to be in that same direction as it was moving. If you go slower and slower and slower, we would call that deceleration or negative acceleration, and that's because the force was in the opposite direction as you were moving. But that's not the only two directions the force could be applied. What about if it was at a right angle to your motion? If the force is always at right angles to your motion, that's going to be producing a centripetal acceleration. The force is toward the center, so the acceleration is toward the center. When that car is going around a circle, it is accelerating toward the center of the circle, just because it's being pushed in that direction. Well, that's not the only direction the forces could be applied. They could be applied at some angles here, and that angle would cause the car to not only accelerate into a circle, it would cause it to accelerate tangentially as well. And that's because this component of that force uh, is pushing the car into the circle. We could say it was a radial component, meaning along the radius. And this could be a tangential component because it's along the tangent. Okay, This force here was kind of opposing its motion, so that force had a component in, accelerating it into a circle, and a force that was opposing its motion, slowing it down. So we have Newton's second law here, that the acceleration is the sum of the forces divided by the mass, or the net force divided by the mass. We often rearrange that for the net force, and a couple things we need to see here is that these are vector quantities that whatever direction the acceleration is in, the net force would be in that same direction. So now we're going to apply Newton's second law to a circular motion. 
So this A sub C here stands for a centripetal acceleration. An acceleration, an acceleration toward the center of the circle was because there was a force toward the center of the circle. A centripetal force and a centripetal acceleration. If we could calculate exactly how fast it was accelerating toward the center of the circle, we just multiply by the mass and we can figure out how much force was on it toward the center of the circle. So that's what we're going to do now. Before we do that, we got to remind ourselves about how to add vectors. A plus B, you add those to the head of A to the tail of B, the head of A to the tail of B, and you draw the resultant. But what is A minus B going to look like? Well, and I'm going to let you choose. Is it going to be A or B? Well, before we answer that, A minus B is algebraically the same thing as A plus a minus B. So A minus B is the same thing as saying A plus a minus B. If this is B, minus B is going to be in the exact opposite direction. So when we do these, we can just add them, the head of A to the tail of B, the head of A to the tail of B, and that is going to be A minus B. Okay, hold on to that idea because we're going to do that right here. If a ball is being whirled around a circle like this, it has some tangential velocity. So at that moment, it's going that direction, and it's on this radius. So it's going to round the circle like this. And we're going to try to calculate how fast it's accelerating toward the center of the circle by measuring its change in velocity over a period of time. So here it was at this moment. A little while later, it's going to be right here. And this was its initial velocity, and this was its final velocity. You can see that the velocity did change. Not the magnitude of its velocity, but the direction of its velocity. It's going just as fast here as it was here. It's just going off in different directions. So let's go ahead and calculate the change in velocity. It's always the final velocity minus the initial velocity. So this is the final velocity as a vector. We have to subtract it by this one. So if this was the final velocity, this was the initial velocity that way, so this is minus the initial velocity. So we're taking that final velocity and we're adding the negative of the initial. That's just subtracting. So we can see that the change in velocity, final minus initial, is in that direction there. Which is kind of neat because as it's accelerating toward the center, the change in velocity is toward the center of the circle. So that also shows that the acceleration is toward the center of the circle. All right, so let's take these two pictures here. We're just going to put them over here. And now we're going to develop an equation to calculate how fast it's going. So the definition here of acceleration, a change in velocity over time. But we have a triangle here and a triangle here. Those two triangles are similar because they have the same angle here and there. So from similar triangles, we could take the short side divided by either of those two sides. They have the same length. So I'm just going to talk about the velocity, not final or initial, just the magnitude of it. So the short side of this triangle divided by the long side of that triangle is going to equal the short side of this triangle divided by the long side of that triangle. So change in velocity over the velocity is going to equal this distance that it traveled divided by the radius. So I need to say s was our arc length. That was this curved distance. And I'm saying it's the same as this straight distance that curve distance would be the same as this straight distance if this angle were super, 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 super small. We could talk about the limit as that angle goes to zero. So it really does just kind of form a, a nice triangle there. So that divided by this is equal to this divided by that. And then we're just going to solve for the change in velocity. I multiplied both sides by V. 
Now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute the change in velocity in for right there. So the acceleration is a change in velocity divided by time, and everywhere I see that, I'm going to substitute in that. So m s over r, and then still multiplied by t, that's going to also calculate the centripetal acceleration. But arc length divided by time, the distance along that arc divided by the time, well, that's just how fast it's going. So arc length divided by time is just another velocity. So we have a velocity here, a velocity here, we get velocity squared. So here it is, this is our equation. The centripetal acceleration can be actually calculated by knowing how fast it's going tangentially, you square it, and you have to divide by the radius of its curvature, how the radius of that circle. But if you plug in how fast it's going in meters per second, and you plug in, and then you square it, and then you divide by meters, you will get a centripetal acceleration in meters per second squared, your typical units of acceleration. So this is Newton's second law. The centripetal acceleration was in the same direction as the centripetal force. And this is how we calculate the acceleration. We just put those two ideas together, substitute this in right here, and the centripetal force would be mass times v squared over r, the centripetal acceleration. All right, let's see if we can just get some conceptual understanding of this equation. In my next video, we're going to actually do more calculations with plugging numbers in. But let's look at these three dots here. Which one has the greatest centripetal force? And we can see that when they get to right, when that blue one gets around right there, they all have the same velocity. They all have the same tangential velocity. So the one with the smallest radius would get the most centripetal force. In fact, if the radius is half as much, the centripetal force would be twice as much. This force here is going to be twice what that force is there. This is a road that I used to drive to home uh, every day. Very dangerous curve here. And what's dangerous about it, that if you're driving up the road here and you get into this turn, that turn starts on one radius and then when you get halfway through the turn, that turn tightens into a much smaller radius. So if the centripetal force is mv squared over r, if we kept the same speed through here, the same tangential velocity, but on a smaller radius, it's going to require more force to push you into a circle. The thing that's providing that force is friction. And remember that there is a limit to how much friction we could get based upon the normal force and the coefficient of static friction. So if you enter this thing at 50 miles per hour, you might be doing fine here, but when the curve tightens like this, uh, you might not have enough friction to push you into a turn and you might end up off into the creek over there. So a lot of people don't take physics that are out driving on the road, and so they have to make signs that uh, they can understand. So pictures here of a truck tipping over, it says curve tightens. But if everybody took physics, they could just say, caution, the centripetal force equals mv squared over r. And you would look at that and say, oh yeah, I gotta be careful, you are right. What about this sign here, the 40 mile an hour? That's, that's the safe speed for that turn. But many uh, students suffer from a disease called YPIS. And the disease YPIS stands for Young Person Immortality Syndrome. And a person driving here and sees that speed limit and think, ah, I can do it at 80. And uh, well, I think if you took that turn at 80 miles per hour, you would flip, roll, crash, and burn and probably die. So make sure you're using good physics here. I did say in my next video, I'm gonna plug in uh, we're going to do more with actually plugging numbers into this equation, but I do want to do one example for you. Uh, this is a roller coaster at Six Flags Magic Mountain in Southern California called the Revolution. 
and it was the first roller coaster in all the world that had an upside down loop in it. And you can kind of tell that the engineers were cautious. Long, straight approach, perfect up and down loop. And um, yeah, worked great. I, I rode it shortly thereafter. Uh, but let, let's look at it this way. What is the minimum centripetal acceleration the coaster needs at the top so that the people don't fall out? Let's say you're not even wearing your seatbelt or a lap bar or shoulder, shoulder um, restraints or anything like that. If the roller coaster were to stop right there, you would accelerate away from your seat at 9.8 meters per second squared, just the acceleration of gravity. So if the coaster is moving into a circle like this, and at that part, if it's accelerating down, if the seat is accelerating down at 9.8 meters per second squared, you're not going to fall away from your seat because your seat is accelerating into you at the same rate gravity's trying to pull you away from your seat. So that's the minimum acceleration you need. Now the question is, how fast tangentially do you need to be going so that that all works? Well, the centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. We need a centripetal acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. The radius was 6.85 meters. If you multiply both sides by 6.85, you get V squared by itself. Then you square root both sides and you get about 8.2 meters per second. If you do dimensional analysis on that, you can convert meters into miles and seconds into hours, 18 miles per hour. That's as fast as you need to go to uh, go through that turn. Now the engineers on this thing did kind of forget about one piece of this, and they kind of made it a fairly straight, uh, smooth, uniform circle. The problem with that is if you're approaching that circle right here, you're going to be going faster down here than you would be going up there because you're going to be coasting and slowing down. So at the bottom here, because you have a high velocity, you're going to have a really big centripetal acceleration. And because the velocity gets squared, a little less velocity creates a lot less centripetal acceleration. The other part of that is here you're accelerating against gravity and here you're accelerating with gravity. So when you're accelerating against the gravity, the, the net force on you would be very large and here it'd be much, much smaller. So when you go over a circular ramp like this, as you enter that turn, you would be pressed into your seat or the seat would be pressing into you really hard and it would be very uncomfortable. So to fix that problem, engineers have now made it more teardrop shaped instead of perfectly circular. So at the top here, you have a small radius and that creates the right amount of acceleration. But at the top here, you have a much larger radius and that reduces your centripetal acceleration at the bottom, making it more comfortable as you enter that loop much more, much smaller centripetal acceleration. All right, let's say that you're a fighter pilot and you are going really fast tangentially on a really small radius that would produce a really big acceleration. But to do that, the plane has to bank, it has to angle uh, into that turn. And just like that ice crystal, if the ice crystal accelerated this direction, the liquid on that wanted to go off straight and that liquid would end up kind of at the bottom of that ice crystal. The, we'll call this the fighter pilot going into a banked turn like this. Their head is toward the center, their feet are on the outside. And what's going to happen there is the blood in your body is going to pool in your legs and feet and it's going to drain away from your head. So that's why fighter pilots have to wear what's called a G-suit. It's like this giant blood pressure cuff where they pump it up and a com the onboard computer would pump air into your legs there while you're doing that maneuver and that would keep the blood from pooling in your legs and feet. Six Flags Magic Mountain in Southern California really is a neat place. <clears throat> There's this roller coaster there called Goliath 
And um, I went on this roller coaster just a couple of days after it opened. And right in through here is this really tight loop, very small radius. It's low down in the roller coaster, so you're going very fast. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have a lot of acceleration and it's banked really sharply. So your head is toward the center and your feet are on the outside and your blood tends to pool in your feet and legs and you almost pass out. In fact, when I did this the, um, in the first week of it opening, uh, I felt like I was gonna pass out and they put us through that turn a little too fast. And I think a couple people in the roller coaster did actually pass out. All right, let me connect back to the, my previous video here real quick. And we're gonna get one more equation we can uh, check off here. But arc length, radius times the angle, but if I divide both sides by time, we would be able to convert an angular velocity to a tangential velocity. So as this thing is going around tangentially and it flies off straight here, we can just connect the angular velocity to the tangential velocity. So if this is how we calculate the centripetal acceleration knowing the tangential velocity, we can substitute this in for here. You gotta square everything inside the parentheses. A radius here and the square would cancel. This is how we would calculate the centripetal acceleration if we knew the angular velocity. So if these cars are going around, we can see they all have the same angular velocity but which car would have the greatest centripetal acceleration? Well, the one with the bigger radius would have the bigger centripetal acceleration. This car, boy, that passenger would be pressed into that uh, outdoor, outside door very strongly. Let me just try to reinforce that equation with this idea. This is a cart and there's uh, water and I have a little food coloring in the water. Right now, the water sits level Gravity is pulling down on that water, but the bottom of that container is pushing up equally. That's why it's not accelerating up or down. And notice that the water sits perpendicular to the normal force, the force of the container pushing it up. If that cart was accelerating to the left, now the bottom still has to be pushing up equal to the weight, but now the, the side here is pushing that this way with a little bit of force. The resultant of those two forces is the net force here and see that the water sits perpendicular to the net force. If the cart were to really accelerate that way, you can well imagine the angle would be pretty steep here. Still, the normal force is equal to the weight of that water, but there's this additional force pushing it to the side and the water sits perpendicular to the net force. And the steeper and steeper that water is, you can see there must have been more and more force sideways. So here, I've got this thing spinning around here. And right here in the center, it's just level. Out here at the sides, it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And what that shows is that if this is at some radius, if we go twice that radius, the force toward the center would be twice as much. Or at three times the radius, the force would be three times as much because the radius and the centripetal acceleration are directly proportional and they all had the same angular velocity. If it had less angular velocity, you would get less acceleration toward the center. So the water wouldn't sit up quite as much. Comparing those two, this is what it was when it had some angular velocity. This is what it was when it had twice the angular velocity. So this was going around kind of slow. This was going around angularly twice as fast. And if it went twice as fast, uh, twice as fast squared would produce four times the centripetal acceleration. So a sub c equals r omega squared, another way of calculating centripetal acceleration. I hope I haven't confused you too much, but uh, we will do some more examples of this in my next video.